Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, drummer, educator, podcaster, and chief creative officer for Drum Factory Direct, Mike Dawson. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, people out in podcast land, drummers, musicians, actors, thought leaders, authors. We're we're interviewing all these people. This is the Rich Redman Show. It's that time. Yep. We talk about all things music, motivation, and success. And as always, so excited to have today's guest. Today's guest, he's a friend. He's a personal friend, but he's also a drummer. He's a journalist. He's an educator. And he's a host of the Drum Candy Podcast. My friend, Mike Dawson. What is up, Mike? Man, that sounds special. Uh, by the way, that sign is killing. I got to get one of them. Isn't that fun? It's all shiny. It's some. I think the dwarves <laughs> made it in the mines of Moria or something. Banged it out. Um, <laughs> but you know what's special. so funny? Your lighting and everything looks great, Mike. You know, when I was in here for 60 episodes with my co-host, Jim McCarthy, which we're still doing it. He's just got some personal things going on. When we were doing it in person. He's so great at the lighting and everything and ever since i Mm -hmm. lost him like i have lights in here but i still have the shadows and stuff i can't quite figure it out man ring light it's a ring light right here i got a ring light right there and so i'm I'm, I'm looking to see like if i should crank it up let me see i'm going to crank it up no that's reducing it coming up yeah i I, look at this and the forehead's all shiny makeup (laughs) i need makeup (laughs) but um I think this is so fun today because you always are shining a light on other people. And I want to shine a light on you today because you do so many things. You do so many things at a high level. We have such a similar background. I don't feel like such a weird alien because you have so many descriptions of like how you creatively splice up your time. You have your master's degree. You do some teaching. You're a journalist. You've hosted two podcasts. By the way, I'm wearing my drum candy podcast shirt Killer. right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a comfy shirt, right? It's really, and it fits like a couture, you know, the yeah, $80 t-shirt. <laughs> you can were, think. Were you responsible uh, finding, for finding the, the cotton or what? N- no, that was Maya at Drum Factor Direct. She went premium. Get, get the best shirts we could for our guests. Absolutely, man. <laughs> I would wear this thing on stage, man. So you were in Jersey a long time. Um, and now you're in Pittsburgh and you're telling me that you just love it. Yes, Tell sir. us about your relationship with Pittsburgh, man. It's, it's brand new. We moved here, um, last November, right, right before Thanksgiving of last of not 2021, but 2020. Yeah. Um, and we had never been here before, you know, we, uh, I played a gig at the hard rock, but that doesn't count, you know, right. that's down on the river and that's, that's not experience in Pittsburgh. So we got i got an offer to change careers and it required me to move here so we were like all right well let's drive to pittsburgh and see what the heck that's all about and we just kind of fell in love with it immediately so it's one of those things we've lived western maryland west virginia i've lived in trailer parks i've lived in center city philadelphia i've lived in you know uh patterson new jersey above a liquor store so like we've been all over the east coast mid-atlantic area and we moved we came out here i was like i think this is home it's funnily enough yeah. i think this might be the spot so i mean what's the deal with trailer parks man you're ready to play some country music right there two trailer parks my rent was 90 dollars a month that's the <laughs> and when was that that's this was i did two years in college i went to west virginia university and a friend of mine's family bought a trailer for him to live in. That was instead of having to pay rent and apartments and stuff, they just bought a trailer. So I had one of the, I had the back room of a trailer for two years. And then the next year I moved in with another buddy who owned a trailer. So I did three years in a trailer park with no, I mean, I had to teach, I had to play one gig and teach one lesson <laughs> to pay my rent. That's so. incredible. I miss those days because <laughs> I remember even like, excuse me, into my early thirties where it was like, my monthly bills were what? Oh my God, I could spend that before breakfast now. It was, there was, right. a, it, was a, it was a special time. You're chasing your dreams. You could live on ramen noodle and next to nothing. It was just all about the drums. It's still kind of all about the drums, man. You know, it's like, we still got that passion. Well, take us back, man. You know, I'm so glad you got that 
uh, you were at Modern Drummer. You were the managing editor at Modern Drummer Magazine, the most widely celebrated drum magazine on the planet. And you, you edited a lot of the books that were published. You did a lot of artist um, close-ups. You did educational columns. And then you did product reviews. Busy mm-hmm. man. Tell us about that time and your responsibilities. I mean, and when I would see these reviews, I would they were always so positive. You know, you would say, well, mm-hmm. it doesn't do this well, but it was never like, this is a horrible product and never buy it. It was like always... Yeah, take us back, man. That's a long time, 16 years. Yeah. Well, yeah, talk about the product review thing. That's funny because I would always, you know, every six months or so, i just Google to see what people were saying. And back, back then, it was drum forums, you know. Like, what are what are people saying on the drum forums about modern drum reviews? And they all said the same thing. Like, oh, he's so damn positive. He never says anything bad. He must be in bed with the advertisers. It was like just curmudgeons. Like, they just wanted nothing more for me to just say something sucks. Um, and my philosophy was that doesn't do anyone any good. So yeah. if, a, and it's not like everything came in and it was good, there was a lot of crap that came in, but I thought it was my obligation to call or email back to manufacturer and say, Hey, I, I can either write a bad review and you can take it as publicity or I can send it back to you and you can, you can address the issues and then resubmit if you want to. I figure why... Why waste money? Because every word in print is very expensive. Every piece of paper. Why waste potentially thousands of dollars to tell someone that their product is crap? What's the point? Now no one's going to buy it. Well, they wouldn't have bought it anyway because we wouldn't have reviewed it. So it didn't make any sense. It was just more like feeding some sort of curmudgeon troll sector of our world that I just didn't want to do. So I always got a product in. If it was worthy of a review, I would try to a play it in, an, in a situation that is appropriate for that product and evaluate it in that that realm. So if it's a beginner level product, I'm not going to take it to the studio and try to make a record with it. You know, like right. what is the application? So that was my philosophy for product reviews. If it's crap, send it back. If it's crap and they want me to review it anyway, just be as as lawyerly as possible with my criticisms and sure. just have it be the way it is. Yeah, back it all up. Yeah, I mean, so, in t- today's world, I mean, it, it's it's there, there's some subpar stuff, but for the most part, you're not going to survive unless you're making incredible stuff. And I think nine times out of ten, there's just really great stuff happening. Am I right? I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, the worst stuff. The thing is, it was always the the upstarts that would send me something that wasn't quite ready for prime time. So <laughs> why why should I bag it? Like, give them a chance to either figure it out or abandon ship on their own. Like, they'll let right. me be the one that tells all the right. drummers who read our magazine that these sticks are terrible when they wouldn't have cared. They wouldn't even known they existed otherwise. Like, right. <laughs> so yeah, the main, the big companies all make good stuff. So I mean, I think today, I mean, I, I started out in the late eighties and stuff wasn't terrible. You know, there was, that was when like the Pearl Export came into be and the Tama Rockstar came into be. Yeah. So it was good stuff, but nowadays, shoot, I think you could get an entry level kit and make a career on it, honestly. For like literally six hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Three hundred dollars, I mean, you're good for, for almost everything. I mean, those PDP <laughs> kits with the wood hoops, you're like, what? Yeah. What, what is this? You know? Yeah. I mean, it really is. It really is special. And you yes. can help me. I think you you helped me with this. You kind of helped us guide this. The fundamentals of drumming book for kids. Yeah. We wrote with uh, Michael Albrecht and. And, and you guys would always get behind it and do the full page ads and stuff. So, man, I appreciate that. That was that was a, a fun process. And what was your background in journalism? Like, were you trained in that or other? Was it because uh, you have your degrees in music education and music. So the you got your mm-hmm. bachelor's degree in music education from West Virginia University and then a, a master's in music from the University of the Arts in Philly which yep, is yep. impressive, man, you know, higher education and it's a lot of time and effort, and money. Yeah. One awesome. year master's program at that school though. That was the big thing. Ooh, if nice. you came in and you were willing to do, I mean, I had to do 18 credits a semester, well, semester 36, yeah. but still I got it done in one year. So that means my student loan was less, you know, yeah. I was done with school by 24. I was yeah. done. And that's with taking a year and a half off between undergrad and grad school. Well, that's impressive um, yeah, that you so, went back. Because <laughs> a lot of people take the time. Well, off. you know, people try to explore and find themselves a year after high school or, man, nine times out of ten, you're not going back to higher education. 
Well, you know, what I ended up doing between undergrad and grad school, I moved back in with my parents. That was, you know, I love them, but that was a bit of a soul crush to have to move back home and sleep in my childhood bedroom again. With your, with and, your trophies, your baseball trophies and all that? Yeah, exactly. And the double ego kicker was I started substitute teaching, like in public school. So I did that, every, you know, three or four days a week for a year and a half. And by the end of it... I mean, I was off for jobs. Like, do you want to take over this high school music program? Do you want to take over this middle school program? By the end, it was like, no, because I'd already gained like 25 pounds. You know, <laughs> like everything was like, no, this is not, this is not the life for me. Yeah. So go back to school and let's get to the next phase. <laughs> My God, Mike, we have such a similar story because I did all the substitute teaching. And sometimes you mm. just go to the um, cafetorium with the kids and you're like, what's for lunch today? I can't believe what they feed these kids. Whole milk corn a slice of pizza and french fries it's like five thousand <laughs> calories at lunch and then if you start that you know eating with the kids you're like what is happening yeah yeah and the apple turnovers wherever they were i would go to taco bell i mean that was it was terrible it was i mean i learned right away that that's not that's not the career path for me i even I even abandoned teaching because I was like the only music sub in the county. So literally any music teacher that would call out, I would get first call. And finally, I was like, I don't want to even do that anymore. I just took an algebra gig. So I taught high school algebra for six months. And it was so much easier <laughs> than trying to teach band. Right. <laughs> so right. much easier. But then it was like, I couldn't. It was, it was clear that my mission in life was not what I thought it was going to be when I was an undergrad. Sure. So that just made me go. And I auditioned at all my favorite schools. Something about U Arts. When I went there at the time, Mark DiCiani was the yeah. director of the School of Music. So it was a very drum centric school. Carl Allen was, was on faculty there. So it just felt like this is the vibe. I was Mark's, you know, signed his graduate assistantship. So it was like, this is a school that's very focused on modern music. It's a one year program. The director is a drummer. I'm going to be his assistant. So I kind of learned a bunch of leadership skills from him. Beautiful. So it was, it was a great choice. And that's what, that literally walked me into the Modern Drummer gig. Okay. That was my okay. journalism background. Was that. Oh, nice. There was one class in that program, Music Journalism for Graduate Students, taught by my predecessor at MD, Rick Van Horn. So I, okay. I was assigned to be his assistant anytime he came down. So I just got to know him and I, in some point, I want to say October of that year, I handed him a transcription of a Roy Haynes solo and he took it up to the office and I got a call the next week. We're going to publish it in the next issue. So I was published while I was a graduate student, which was crazy. And then, um, then it was like an invite to become the jazz transcription guy for Modern Drummer. That was kind of my role. And then at the end of the year, um, Rick pulled me aside and said, hey, we need to add a new editor. So I want to like you to come up with an interview for it. That was right. it. So I got my master's degree. Two months later, was moving to North Jersey to work at MD. Yeah. I and you, that, was your, that was your day job. And you would still play at night to do, do the thing, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So close to the city. Yep. Yeah, I was going in all the time to the Jazz Standard. It was like my favorite club because I lived yeah. I lived in Patterson, so it was, I mean, within a half hour I could be anywhere in New yeah. York. So I had no obligations, no pets, nothing. So it was just go go in two or three nights a week, whatever. I love that. So, so it's a lot like of great you, music. You put a put a roof over your head with a with a with a skill related to drumming, so you could still explore your passion. So you know to the listeners out there, to the young bucks out in the audience. And then your background, you know, it's a music, you just, your first degree is in music education. And I remember mm -hmm. those days, I mean, we are so similar, did the same thing. So I'm at Texas Tech University learning how to properly change the note on a French horn and working on my trumpet embouchure and then how to get over the break on the clarinet and then having so <laughs> much fun with seventh position trombone. And then the bassoon, <laughs> I love the bassoon, you know, and then you're learning how to like score, um, uh, for an orchestra like writing by hand so this is like pre-sibelius and and then you learn you take your conducting, conducting class yeah Ooh, i mean <laughs> so i would say that a lot of this stuff it doesn't really come in handy but it, it really does i mean how many drummers that play in rock bands out there can conduct a symphonic band right or you know 
uh, yeah. know the, the 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 range of a clarinet and all that and that stuff gets mm. rusty i mean it's been so many years for me i would have a hard time doing it but i there's definitely some use for that stuff uh the reading music yeah, all that stuff yeah yeah all of it writing out charts for gigs i mean yeah i, I haven't had like a steady gig in years it was always just someone needs a fill in and so send me the song list and i've got three days to chart out yeah. 50 songs or whatever not the most fun way to make a an extra money as a drummer but i can write up charts fast i can i can analyze yeah. the form on one listen because i can hear the chord changes like yeah. all those skills and then i ended up subbing on broadway for a couple of years talk about knew, that talk knew, about that because that's a that's not that's a hot seat man and that's a that's a that's a cool thing well, it was kind of like a culmination. First of all, Carter McLean, I'm um, so grateful that he trusted me enough to invite me to learn the show. Um, that I can't imagine being a main drummer on a Broadway show and having to find subs so, that you know aren't going to get Lion you fired. King, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, on The Lion King. So he invited me. So then it was, you know, I went in to watch the show four or five times, got a copy of the book. I went to Kinko's, made my own copy of the book. That was a whole other issue. I went to Kinko's to make a copy of the book. And then something happened when I couldn't get back into the theater the next day and Carter had to call out. He's like, dude, you're going to bring that book back. I got to call out. And the sub didn't have his own book. Oh, so no. I had to like scramble <laughs> to get the book back in. Oh, Lesson man. learned. Don't take the book out of the pit. Um, so anyway, I mean, it was a culmination of everything that I've ever done because I had to, had to analyze what he was, I had to read the charts, interpret what he was doing versus what was written, make a bunch of notes. I mean, I saw the show four or five times and then I had to make notes about what's the conductor doing, what's, you know, all the stuff. Yeah. And then um, I had to transcribe his playing note for note. Like I got a, I got a board feed from a couple shows and I just transcribed all of his fills, all of his beat variations, everything that he did, I transcribed it. So I learned the show top to bottom I want to say 90% note for note for what he does every day. Because his so parts his didn't tran- change took much. his transcriptions and like got that into your DNA kind of in a memoriz- memorized way so that you could not have to read the transcription, but just read the book and follow the conductor and all that. Yeah. 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 Luckily, he and I have similar playing backgrounds. So a lot physically, a lot of the stuff felt comfortable. It wasn't like I was learning a whole new vocabulary, but right. there were some things, some things that were new. And then... Um, so yeah, I had to transcribe the book, I had to learn, you know, all the, the conducting nuances of four or five different conductors and they all have different things. Um, oh boy. And then the, <laughs> essentially the audition was I had to film myself playing along to it. Like, cause I couldn't go, I couldn't go in and play the show without him seeing me do some of it. So then all the skills I learned in video production and audio editing, Wow. I, within like a week I was able to, he was like, yes, first song's good. Second song's good. Keep going, keep going. So wow. by you know, a couple of weeks of prep, I was ready for my first show. At least I thought I was ready. But you know, it was a culmination of everything, kind of playing with a click track, all that stuff. The politics of you know, thirty musicians with different levels of ego and stuff, and having intermission. The guitarist might tell you one thing, and the bass player might tell you something else, and the conductor is going to tell you another thing. Wow! All of that stuff. And all the subs. So I'm sure he had like three or four subs, right? I think at that time he had at least at least four or five, I think. The Rich Redman Show will be right back. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. So the anatomy of a Broadway drummer's job is you're doing rough around, I believe, seven shows a week, something like that, because there's two on Sunday, is there not? Eight, sometimes nine. Eight or nine shows a week. And Carter lives in Connecticut, right? So he's got to come in every day, do the thing, and yeah. then after the show, go drive back. And you're and the the consistency is so it's got it's gotta be at the highest level. And then you've got to have these subs that you trust because 
if he decides he wants to work with his own band or take some cool opportunity, he could sub it out or go on vacation. But that's a pretty neat thing to have a job 52 weeks a year that you can mm -hmm. leave it whenever you want to. But nerve wracking because you are championing another human being to say, this guy will cover, you will not miss me. Yeah, yeah. If I screw up, it's more of a problem for him than it is for me, really. Because they can just fire me, fine, and find another sub. But if he consistently brings in bad subs, yeah, that's a problem. That's a serious problem. Yeah, and the so, music is so, so complex would, nowadays, you know, with loops and, and triggers and electronics and incorporating uh, percussion. Like, I'm sure back in the day, it was, you know, when they came up with this methodology, um, you know, sub whenever you want. It was more like... Shh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gaga ding, gaga ding, you know, bing, bop, boom, <laughs> bop, boom, bop, bop, bop. You know, a little woodblock action. But now it's like straight on modern, like a reflection of modern music. Yeah, the, a lot. There's a couple spots where you have to like flick a mic on with a foot switch that's on the, the temple blocks. Like little little choreography that like if you Definitely. screw that up, you're going to hear it from the front of the house. Like what the hell happened to the granite blocks? Why well, I, I forgot the mic, you know, <laughs> or like whatever little things. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I went up to and the there was, pit there's for, an uh, octopad, so you had oh, to yeah. do that. Oh God! Yeah, yeah. Sammy Marandino had like an octopad mm. and like uh, like two SPDSXs, and the the music is in weird places because he's got to be able to watch the video, and he's not even in the same room as the rest of the band. He's like upstairs in his own little drum yep. closet, and he has all these electronic pedals, and he, you got to coordinate all that. And if you're not able to get on the guy's kit, then what do you do? You make little like cardboard cutouts of the pedals and you have to that's what i did that's what right. i did i printed out an octopad i didn't have an octopad so i just printed out a, a to scale version on paper you so i could just hitting in time oh yeah i could just God. practice the choreography of because i had to go from i think it was tom's to flip over to play the electronics in like a bar and a half yeah so just that whole choreography not knocking the snare drum over not you know just getting not pulling your in ears out so yeah i had to work all that <laughs> that stuff out <laughs> yeah I, I mean but that's probably like back in the day when we were um studying you know 20th century percussion and you have to do a multi-percussion piece where you have all these different drums and then different striking utensils that you have to coordinate well to yeah, play this yeah. and then i have to put it down here so i can grab it in, in the next scene and oh where's the triangle beater i mean that's stuff that, there it goes it's, <laughs> it's paying off man. so you did one yeah like the one, one thing like rolling rolling on a bass drum something i'd forgotten how difficult that actually is to do because the head moves so slowly you know yeah, that it, yeah. to get a smooth roll it can be like blah, 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 blah. so that was like wow i'm glad i studied classical percussion because at least i know to expect this like all yeah. the little things how to play a triangle properly yeah there was one one shaker thing that has to be perfectly 16th note out I'm like, thank God I was in a, a salsa ensemble in college, you know, like, oh, so you mean like I know how to play it. Yeah, like perfect 16th notes. Right. And it's just for like a couple bars. You got to put it right in the microphone. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, but Mike, you did that and that's a big one. And so, you know how it is. It's so much easier to get a job when you, you know, you, you kick the door open and you're like, well, I did this successfully and I'm still on the call list. So if you, you know, this ever opens up again and we get through this thing, are you planning on maybe like trying to get some other sub jobs? Like, let's let me do Spider Man. Let me do uh, you know, uh, you know, no, no. I told I told Carter like this is this is it for me. Like this is the one show because it, it's a lot of maintenance. I couldn't the guys who guys and girls in town who are doing like multiple shows. Like Brian Delaney is like on a couple of shows. I'm yeah. like, how do you remember? I don't know like, how, yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't have the mental. I don't have the mental capacity or the nervous system to handle that. You know, because right. it's. It's not fun. It's very intense. It's not fun. It's it's sort of. I mean, I've never been skydiving or done too much thrill activities, but I feel like it's probably similar. You know, like I didn't yes. die. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. The whole skydiving thing. I just always worry about the guy. Well, um. Oh, he took the wrong backpack, or the guy packed it incorrectly, or you're you're toast. It's a man. lot of trust. A lot of trust in other people, and I ain't yeah. good at that. Trusting a stranger, <laughs> man. Well, I'm so glad you got to do that, man, and. You know, if people are, are following you on the, the crazy, the socials, like Instagram, you always are posting some, some, you playing, and for a while you had this 
you'd be playing on top of loops and they were running through pedal boards. And I was like, what is this Mm -hmm. setup? And it's because it's like, I want to do something like that because I've been doing clinics for so long. And it's like, boom, whack, boom, boom, whack, play on a hit song, talk to the kids about this or that, or this is how you can apply syncopation. Um, I was like, I want to do this stuff, man. So are you still kind of like messing with that? Is that, is that rig still together? Or are you like, no, I've already moved on. A little bit of, I want a little bit. I want to move away from it, but then a couple months ago, the pedal broke, and I haven't. Um, the loop pedal broke, and I haven't busted out the other because I have a Line Six looper that has a bunch of effects in it. But this was a Ditto Ditto looper, and it just like crapped out. So I was like, all right, that's the universe telling me to like just play some drums for a while and not worry about all that crap. But it's still there. I mean, I I started doing it for two reasons. I was afraid to play drums by myself, like just the anxiety of of starting from nothing. I just wouldn't do it and then um so i could create like textures and and atmospheres and different time signatures that were like you know just improvise stuff and loop it and i was like oh that's in six cool now i can now i have a context to to be creative in yeah or this one's in five cool not having because i didn't have good success of like opening up ableton and like programming stuff like that then it felt like i was playing to something i was playing to someone else's thing it wasn't me yeah, whereas if yeah. i just if i just improvise on a wave drum threw it through a loop pedal and distortion and then just click the button at some point <laughs> then it's me you know it's my rhythm being looped yeah. and i felt like it was just more it was more pure when i would just play versus if i would program something in the morning and then take it to the drum kit that didn't work. I feel like I was having to like play someone else's track. Yeah. Which that's what I do for money. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to like make up my own stuff. Make your own music. So yeah, we run. Yeah, that makes sense to me, Mike. I mean, it really does because there's days that I'm in here and I'm inspired by folks that I see on Instagram and they're like, let's do the coachy thing and like prepare the drums and like use all this wacky vintage stuff. And there's a there's a Vic Firth rake in my right hand and there's a, a mallet in the <laughs> and there's a you know we got the rivet symbol and you can kind of create and vibe out and everything but like deep down i'm like what's the song like give me a mm-hmm. song i want someone to come in and go wing wacko dingle wacko wingo do blah i mean that's where i like to live you know i want to play a song with another human being mm. yeah this was my i guess my way of doing that because i didn't have a band you know at my disposal in a, and so it was like i'm let me improvise something that's that's not drums i'm improvising yeah. on a, a wave drum or a nord drum that has like melodic elements or a yeah. uh, a mandala drum which is super crazy because you don't know what it's going to do so that would give me a song to play for you know lack of a better term yeah there's a song now I come up with a part that's cool and again it's like just coming out of being organically that day and and i had a point where i would just delete it i wouldn't save any of them i would just delete it so i'd do it record it post it delete it so like there's no coming back if someone said hey can you can you show me what you did on that loop like nope i have no freaking clue what patch i used what effect chain i used it's gone and you're getting busy that was all for um yeah that was all literally before drum clinics because from for clinics i was focusing on how to practice creatively like how to how to stoke a creative mindset every time you practice right so i thought it'd be disingenuous to go up with a bunch of pre-planned stuff right to play to like now like you're not improvising you're playing the crap you prepared right. so for clinics it was like there's the looper there's the wave drum i'm going to see what this room is telling me to do and then have to play over it and whatever it is is what it is oh, that man. was the whole premise yeah well that's sometimes it was cool for me, sometimes it wasn't I'm going to steal that from you and try to like when this kind of opens back up i mean for about two years we've been living staring into that little green light on this uh on this Mac, um, but when things kind of like get busy again, it, it, I want to have like 20, 15, no, 15 minutes of my clinic be something like that. So you've inspired me, man. Mm. Very cool. Very cool, man. Yeah, all I need is a loop pedal. It's yeah, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to hook it up. Um, now, are, aren't you teaching at that same university you got your master's at? Aren't you kind of yes, like, the University okay. of Arts. You're on staff. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I was teaching private lessons all last year. I've been teaching the journalism course that I originally took as a student. I've been cool. teaching that for, yeah. I mean, I think I started teaching that in 2008 or something, maybe before. 
So I still teach journalism lessons depending on what's going on with student enrollment um, and then go back and do workshops or whatever every once in a while. And I have another school down in um, Buchanan, West Virginia, West Virginia Wesleyan. I have a private student there. Nice. So yeah, I'm still, I've been teaching since I was 14. So it would just be really weird for me to not <laughs> teach yeah. anymore. Yeah. Like I feel like I have to give back in some way. I mean, I, I started teaching my, my classmates in middle school and it just, it never stopped. So I have to have my hands in it. I don't love teaching online. I do it, yeah. It, I mean, it's just, the, it's just the way it is, but it's not my favorite. It's kind of hurting my passion for it in some ways, but you know, it'll open back up eventually. We have yeah. To. I like being like one foot from a student, be able to put my hand on their shoulder and encourage them or like give them the evil eye. Like you didn't practice, you're not prepared. You know, that, that whole thing is, is like so special, like the nun, you know, with the ruler, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I've always taught too, man, you know, like I, I think that I was teaching as early as like, maybe 17 years old because once you once you can have have a skill set and you can effectively communicate it and break it down you really have the permission to show another human being you know you're you're developing that thing you did 250 episodes with the other mike the mike and mike show for modern drummer yeah a lot of content you guys interviewed a million drummers and you, then you called it quits and now you're hosting the drum candy podcast and yes, check sir. this out, folks. I mean, wow. You're interviewing legends like Ash Schoen, Billy Martin, Aaron Sterling, Joy Warner, Warnker, Josh Fries, Todd Zuckerman, Larno, Lewis, Matt Chamberlain, Glenn Kochi, then all my national buds, Keo Stroud, Chris McHugh, Kevin Murphy, Near Z, percussionists like Damon Grant. Um, and then this, I love the episode with Kenny Sheritz. He was like, boom, you tune it to this note on the top and this note on the bottom, and you got <laughs> this sound, and you tune it to this note on the bottom and match it. And, the, and I reached out to him after I couldn't believe we weren't friends on Facebook. And I was like, Kenny, dude, your, your knowledge of tuning drums quickly and effectively to give different, it's like, it's so inspiring. He's like, oh man, I love the drum community, man. I re you, can, you are doing such a great job with that podcast because you're such a great host. You're not a spaz like me. You're not a Jerry Lewis. You're like almost like a, um, you're like a Paul Harvey. You know, it's like you're very, it's a great, everyone check out the Drum Candy podcast. Tell us, tell us about the journey and, and you know. Uh, I don't know who Paul Harvey is. Who's he's Paul just like Harvey? A really, he was a really effective um, radio host. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, look him up. He's, he's, he's chill, man. He was chill. He was just very articulate, never missed a word, never missed a beat. His timing was mm. in, impeccable, you know. Well, what do you want to know? How do I do oh, that? What? Yeah, well, <laughs> how did it come about? Of, you know, tell us about Drum Factory Direct and the, the idea for the yeah. podcast. And, and, and then, you know, the first season was focusing on everybody's first snare drum. And then you started yeah, focusing yeah, yeah. on more about getting sounds in the studio. And part mm -hmm. of me thinks what I like what you're doing is you're like, I'm going to take essentially a lesson and pick everybody's brain and get all the information I want to be a better drummer while providing a public service. Am I right? I mean, look, I worked at Modern Drummer for s almost 17 years and I yeah. got to interview almost all of my heroes. Amazing. I do not take that opportunity lightly. So if I'm going to be in a studio with Steve Jordan for three hours, we're going to do a photo shoot and I'm going to sit down and, ask, and interview him. I'm going to get a private lesson out of this dude. Yes. Like, come on, who can say they've had Steve Jordan show them how he plays a groove, you know, yeah. like, so I, that was my tactic. Every time I interviewed anyone for, for MD was it's a two hour lesson. Like, yeah. ask all the questions that I need to know for wherever I'm at in my stage of development. So that just stuck with me with, you know, getting into the podcast world. It's like, again, I mean, I don't take it for granted that you and Matt Chamberlain and these people will call me back, you know, like I, <laughs> I have a relationship to where I can be like, hey, Matt, you want to just talk about snare jumps for an hour and a half? Yes. OK. He would probably not say that to anyone else. All right. I'm going to ask you all the questions that I need to know about how you get your snare drum sound. Like that's just, I'm not, cause I'm not going to interview him again, probably for a couple of years. Right. So yeah, for me interviewing is like, ask your hundred dollar questions, bring them. All they can do is say, I don't know, or 
I don't want to talk about that. Fine. But yeah. I want to know, what do you put inside your bass drum? Tell me. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. important information. <laughs> well, the, que the questions are great because you really do your research. Like on like, uh, like with Matt, you were fam very familiar with a lot of, you know, his body of work. And you were like, okay, for the Fiona Apple, right? right like, what was that sound? And, and then with Chris McHugh, you're like, I noticed you get these three different types of sounds. And so on this particular mm -hmm. track, what song, like what drum was it? So it was so funny because I feel like, I mean, you and I are friends in the real world, um, not just the interwebs, the matrix. Um, and it, when I was on tour this last year, I would go do my six mile run every day and I listened to Drum Candy podcast. And I would have mm. to stop because then you would say something really profound like, oh, Chris uses this such and such Yamaha drum with wood hoops. And then I would, I'd have to write it down in my notes. And so I have all these <laughs> drums that I want to buy or modify my existing drum so so like mm -hmm. you're like a, you're like i would like a friend in my ears like so now i'm hooked and every week <laughs> right. i'm on i'm right. listening to the drum candy podcast running my six miles so thank you thank you yeah well i feel like for whatever reason it got like uncool to ask fav famous drummers like the dumb questions like it just got like uncool like, when did oh, you start playing don't ask them yeah, don't ask them that what pedal they're using. Come on, that's that's for the that's for the dumb kid to ask. But there hasn't been one person. I've had 34 episodes now. Yeah. There hasn't been one person that's like I really don't want to talk about gear. I mean, it's just intrinsic. We sit behind this weird apparatus and you have to think about what your pedal is. You have to think about what you know, what bottom the wires on your snare drum are. Yeah. So I'm just going to ask you those questions and I'm, and I'm trying to come from a place. I am coming from a place of genuine curiosity. It's not like, oh, what sticks do you use? Cool. What has you use? I want to know because I want to try it. Yeah. Like I, like I don't ask if someone doesn't have a certain type of snare drum sound. I don't really, I'm not going to ask them that question. I might ask them about electronics or something that's more appropriate to them. Right. So I don't know. Hopefully it translates. I'm genuinely a geek. I mean, I'm, I have, I have an old Slingerland snare right here. Yeah. Folks, <laughs> Mike is in his that studio. I, I'm, yeah. uh, I'm, you're I'm experimenting with cleaning yeah. up. Yeah. I'm just every day I'm tuning drums and changing heads. I'm just a nerd. The so, only time I like those stick chopper uh, rims is if I'm never going to hit the drum. Uh, well, I'm only going to hit it in the middle. Like if I'm mm. doing rim shots, I cannot stand those stick choppers, man. Because they destroy sticks, or you just don't like the way it feels. Yes, yeah, both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, like, I'm not convinced. Like diecast, you know, it's like diecast. I have very few drums, and I know that it focuses the sound and helps the drum stay in tune longer. And it's got like a like a certain character and color to it. But I'm just such a triple flange guy. I just you know I've always mm. had, you know. But I'm open. Like I was taking notes on those thirty something episodes. Like oh. Um, Oh, so if you take this horrible standard uh, pawn shop drum that you bought for $75, you could put, you know, 30 strand wires on the bottom. You could put the wood hoops just on the top. Or what if I put those brass hoops on the top and bottom and then I put a trick mm. throw off on it? I mean, it's like, so I'm getting geek. <laughs> I feel guilty about our interview because you're just like, this guy doesn't care about gear. Because I do. It's and It's just that I don't. It's not my thing where I'm getting called to play the 30 inch bomber bass drum with the Hawaiian yeah, right. picture on the front or being asked to take the front head off of my bass drum or play concert toms. I mean, most of the work I get is like, you're going to play a modern drum set and, and it's high yeah. fidelity, you know, but. Well, I, I mean, what I yeah. honestly, yeah. what I loved about your, the way, what you brought to the show was like cover your bases dude i've got my bases covered and why do i need to worry about a, 18 variations of of an acrylite just get an acrylite just get a yeah. superphonic just get a black beauty right that's we're good to go what more do you need right right <laughs> and right. i think and that's I, important i mean yeah especially yeah. The, i mean what for what you're what you're doing you know it's it's like it's get there get there quickly and let's go so yeah I learned a lot. I mean, I learned I, everyone's a, everyone's a gear geek. So I, I might introduce some people as more or less, but deep down, we all, I don't know any drummer that does, literally doesn't care about the instrument they're hitting. How's yeah. that possible? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know how it's possible.
That's can no, you know, you have to, you have to. Um, yeah, so I need to go back and re-listen to the episodes, and I because I know that there's you and I talked about it. It's the because um, I interviewed Mickey Curry. That drum, mm. it's the it's a Yamaha six and a half with I think wood hoops maybe, and it's fat, and it's how he got all those big radio hits. So oh, the Brian Adams drum. Yeah. Yeah. Who was talking about that? I don't even remember who was talking. Was that Chris? I don't even it's remember a who was drum. talking. I, I, well, yeah, I it's think like I, a recording custom. Yeah. birch drum right so mickey told me about it and then chris told you about the mickey curry drum okay yeah it's one of those birch like re uh, recording customs or something i know i gotta find one i want to treat myself to one and if i have to get rid of a couple <laughs> i'm looking at like you know 16 snare drums in my studio over here right on the wall when you start thinking about it, you're like okay i got 16 snare drums there i got 20 snare drums in cartage <laughs> i got eight <laughs> snare drums in los angeles i have six on the road dude come it's like and this is like and this is after you thin the herd every couple of years you know mm. yeah i've been on a um a symbol thinning mission lately right because i've just been collecting again i was so fortunate to test so much gear at modern drummer and then at the end of the process it was like well you can either send it back or buy it it's like well why am I going to send it back if I really like it? Let me just <laughs> buy it and I will get like artist deals or whatever. So I have like so many symbols. So it's now it's like, all right, do I really need all these ride symbols? How many do I really use? I've got like 20 ride symbols. How yeah, many I got do a lot you of rides. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a cool room. Yeah, man, I would love. I, it's yeah, like check it out. Old Ludwig. It looks like a, it looks like kind of like a West Hollywood hotel, just white and black. Yeah, this I'm actually getting this um, audio mute is coming in to to trick this out next month. So I'm nice. getting like a like a like a, a whitewash blue kind of vibe happening. It'll be totally different. This is just an old clear sonic booth that I deconstructed and put behind the kit. Wow. But yeah, I have yeah. my old Ludwig 68s in there. I bought these from my FedEx man. He was retiring and moving to Florida. And he knew I was a drummer, so he was he off giving me first dibs. Like these these need to go to someone who's gonna take care of them and play them. So it's all original. Like he just had it in his house since nineteen sixty eight. Wow. That is so cool. My brother my brother actually is a FedEx man. He works the he drives the big rigs through the night um for thirty years now or something like that. It's like wow. yeah, he's a FedEx man. He's you know gonna have that four oh one K in the retirement. That's right, go to Florida. I'm happy. But you know you go, what? I guess. The floor, my parents live in Florida, man. And when I go down there for the holidays, I'm like, I get it. Like, I don't like the bugs. And I don't, I don't like June, July, August in Florida. But hey, there's air conditioning. There's pools. <laughs> and, you know, the, the sun is always <laughs> shining. Um, and it's just way cheaper than California. But, you know, it's not, <laughs> sexy. it's not as sexy as California. But my so my parents are there. Our guitar player Jack moved there, and it's like it's like I'm starting to get it more. Like why people go down to Florida for mm. the last 15 years. Man, do you think there's going to be an exodus from Nashville soon? Like, there's so many people coming there. Is it going to be like the, you know, previous generations like get the hell out of here now? Like what's, God, I don't what's know. happening uh, down there? I, I just I just feel like uh, you know uh, you know houses that were three hundred thousand dollars are now seven fifty eight nine so what? it's going really really crazy it really really is um but still afford it more affordable than california and we don't quite have the homeless problem <laughs> you know it's it's such a sad thing to see it's gotten so every time i go back to la it's just like more and more it's like a problem hmm it really is you haven't been there in years i almost moved there so i almost decided I was auditioning to go to USC or Cal Arts. Yeah, I got with John Bergamo and yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got waitlisted at both schools, so that was what ended up pushing me to Philly. So imagine, I had no idea what I'd be doing in my life if I had gone to Cal Arts for grad school. Who knows? Yeah. No idea. Yeah. yeah, man. You know, I think that we're, that we're there's like we make these decisions in our life, but at the same time, I think we're being pulled along by some sort of uh, higher power that's kind of directing us in the direction. And there's only really one thing and we do mm -hmm. it you know do we do it and you are definitely reaping the rewards my friend you know i heard this podcast i i i listened to uh matt krauss's working drummers podcast with on your episode and what i pulled from it was this interesting story 
of when you were 18 years old and you had a whiplash moment when you they threw a, a teacher threw a metronome <laughs> at you that's a great oh, story to relive that one all right here we go well i, I was an go- all state yeah yeah i was an all state big band so i did all state orchestra sophomore junior year senior year i was like all right i'm gonna try out for the big band because i that's i'm a drum set player and I've, I've been playing big band with the local community college you know i was 17. so i was kind of a hot shot you know i was like all right i can i can play big band i'm gonna get so i got in the all state big band first chair and we get to the first rehearsal um first of all if if you know who Warren Wolf is, he's a world class vibraphonist, like wow. insanely good. He was in the band. He was the vibraphonist. So and he could play drums better than me. So from the first rehearsal, it was like, okay, this guy's a freak. Like so he was like the 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 highlighted performer for the big band. We're both eight, 17, 18 years old. Wow. So already my ego's like, whoa, I can't even play drums as good as a guy who's a vibraphonist. Hmm, all right. All right. We got we got problems here. That was the first blow. And then we get to rehearsal and we were playing some kind of like a Mel, I don't remember what it was, like a Mel Lewis shuffle or something. And the conductor stops the band and he throws a little tiny digital metronome at me. And he goes, turn that on to... Uh, 60 and that's going to be two and four and count us off and i that was it i was done did, it really wants you to play I, to it while kicking the band he wanted me to turn the metronome on so it was just on two three four so all i was hearing was this and i had to do a one two three with a 16 piece big band or whatever yeah they're, they're gonna cover never the done it before in my life yeah, and it was one of those little tiny, like, pocket-sized little digital things where it's barely a blip. It just, and I couldn't do it, and that was it. I was like, all right, that that ruined this experience for me. That so what do bad. I do from here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I had no idea. So, I mean, part of me is like, I'm glad he did that, but it took me 15 years to finally realize what he was doing, you know, like, what was the point? It just became like, I suck. And I guess my time always sucks. So cool. I'm that drummer. You know, that that's kind of what it felt like for 10, 15 years. There was no yeah. course of correction. <laughs> you know, it was no like, cool. He should have well, pulled me aside. You were, you were a great reader. Like, you, you had great hands. You had dynamic control. You could play the styles and you could read. But the time need work. The time needs yeah. just some work, you know, and that comes from playing with records and playing with metronomes and being in the Which trenches. Which I'd never done. Yeah, yeah. I never I never played along to a big band record. So it was it was really humbling. I mean it was good in some ways, but I think it also set me back a lot. If if you would have pulled me aside at lunch and been like, Hey, you're dragging. I think you're listening to the ensemble too much and I don't I think you need to focus on your internal time. So can you just go practice with a metronome for the because we were in like a week like we were at a hotel, the band was all together for like a week to rehearse and then play. If you would just give me some tactics and then I would have seen that there's there's light at the end of the tunnel, but it was just like, I can't play in time. Cool. Ah. I can do all this other crap, but I can't play in time. So it took me until I was 30 to be like, maybe there is a way to practice this. Right. <laughs> you know, so, like so really get I, it dialed have in. Have you kept in touch with that cat? I mean, is he still an educator? Uh, I have no idea. I don't even remember what school. I tried to look him up at one point if there was any public records. I think he was from like Indiana, some Indiana school. Um, You're just like scouring uh, the internet for his obituary. Yeah, I just wanted to know who he was. Like, I, I wanted to get a because my memory of him was he was kind of a mullet head kind of jerk. Um, but I don't think that's fair. It's just my memory of him as a 17 year old, like this mullet head jerk who's not even doesn't have any gigs. <laughs> We're back to that thing. Like, who is this guy? Who is he right, worthy right. of? of well, no, me around but like you that. took that experience in it and you said, ne- not me. I'm not going to be that educator. I'm going to be more encouraging. Well, yeah, I mean, it was, again, I mean, I mean, I was first chair in the All-State Jazz Band. There was something there. Yeah. If he could have just been like, this is a problem. You need to fix it and you'll be that next level. That's all he would have had to say rather than you failed. Good luck getting through the rest of the week, which is what yeah. it felt like. So whatever. I mean, yeah. it was weird. That was that was definitely a moment. So, but then you know what? I learned 
conductors are, are a certain breed of people too, you know? So, oh, but yeah. then again, when I, when I was playing Broadway, it was like, okay, you're dealing with one person who's controlling everybody in this building. There's an inherent arrogance involved in that seat. Yeah. So you're going to get a lot of notes and you're not going to, you just can't take it personal. You know, you can't, like, take, it, you can't take it personal. I, I remember being, having that same experience, same age at the, um, the all Texas, all state orchestra. So, so to mm. get in there, you had to have like a buttery press roll, Anthony Cerrone, do the thumb roll on the tambourine, be able to choose the right mallets for the xylophone, play Porgy and Bess, hit a beautiful crash, get a note, get a nice tone, all that stuff. So somehow I end up in this orchestra and this insane, uh, berserk, berserker kind of eccentric mad scientist conductor. I don't have no member of the, you know, like the guy from back to the future, you know, that kind mm. of guy. And he's like, Mr. Percussionist, you're more on top of the beat than Ed Shaughnessy. <laughs> and I was like, he's like, do you know who Ed Shaughnessy is? And I'm like, yeah, the Tonight Show drummer, Johnny Carson. And he's like, you're more on top of the beat than that guy. Fix it. And you're like, okay, so you're, you're trying to lay back and I'm playing a glockenspiel with brass mallets at double pianissimo. And you're just trying to like, and, but then the flip side of that, when I was at Texas Tech University, we had this amazing conductor, James Suddeth, and he could just control the orchestra mm. with just little movements and bring out the best in the players. And he would, he would stop and be like, Mr. Redmond, no. Again, boom. Mr. Redmond, one more time. Bam. And you get it. You get the wink. Thank you. Yeah. But then you got to cool. figure out what the hell did I do? <laughs> yeah. But then you get the wink. Like, that's the way it needs to be every time. So it was kind of like tough love, but I don't know. Teaching is such an art form, man. I'm, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I appreciate some of the, the tough love to it. Like, the, again, the conductor for Lion King after the first show apparently does he, he's done this with every sub ever you have to go into his office and he just r goes through like a litany of notes like every piece had like five or six notes and he would he would kind of like quiz you like what is happening when you play this conga part i'm like what do you mean i'm just trying to get to the end of the show it's like can't you hear the shaker over here i'm like no dude i did my first show man so it was a lot of that like yeah. you know can you make the bass drum sound heavier but not louder like i don't know dude there's a mic on it and i've got a mallet you know i love, I love this and, I, and I, I love how you made this decision like hey i experienced this and i'm not doing it again like that's that's to be respected as well man you know you know it's bringing you joy in your heart you know what i mean and life is short yeah, yeah. i mean that's incredibly stressful geez man um what is your uh, your role at drumfactorydirect.com and tell us a little bit about that because you know, I went to the website and I basically any widget or part or wing nut or wire for any manufacturer of any decade. That's a big mm -hmm. operation. Like who's the brainchild behind this and how does that work? Yeah, it's um, Matt Willie's the founder. It's a family owned business. So it's him and his wife and, and daughter primarily run the business. And then they have some employees that that kind of do the operations and customer service um he started out as a drum builder the company was called global global drums he was making um segment shells like hand making hand turning shells um i believe the story is he hurt his back so he couldn't build anymore and he had just had a stockpile of parts like hoops and lugs and everything so he just started selling them on ebay and it just took off so his yeah. business just pivoted from making drums to just selling all the parts to make drums right and it's just grown i think that was 2007 or 8 um so now we're like the we're like the leading retailer of dw parts like literally if you call dw and say i need a new tension rod for my whatever kit they'll say call drum factor direct and like Amazing. they've they've got it right uh, so they've been they've been very successful just kind of building it up like that and then last november randomly i went on uh LinkedIn, this goes back to the universe kind of pulling you wherever the hell it's going to. Because I never check LinkedIn, like maybe once every six months. And just so happened that day, I got a message from Matt Willie asking me if I would be interested in writing, like rewriting descriptions for all the products. 
and doing some other like copywriting. And it's like, sure, what do you, you know, what's, what do you have in mind? And he sent me some links. And the links that he sent me were for pieces that I had either written or edited or were the brainchild of for Modern Drummer. So it was like, oh, you want me to redo the pieces I've already done? He didn't, he didn't know that it was me. It was like wow. pieces like this Modern Drummer story. Like, well, that was, I created that and I signed it to a writer. Or like this, like, well, that's, that's me. That's me playing that drum in that video. <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. You actually <laughs> so did a demo in. for the Black Sheep uh, pedal. Thank you. You like when when yeah Black exactly Sheep came out. You were you put on your uh, I think you had like some killer Doc Martins or some cool <laughs> rock and roll boots, and you were s- <laughs> slamming on that thing, man. Nobody wants to see a foot cam, right? That's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I mean, yeah. So he offered. You know, I first came on as a copywriter, and then the more and more we talked, it was, you know, our philosophies were aligned, and he's been looking for someone to fill the creative direction, the creative director position, which is, you know, overseeing all the, cause there's, there's no original photography, like all this stuff needed to be done, product demos. So that's the conversation just turned into, well, we want to hire you full time. You can either do full time as a freelancer, or if you move to Pittsburgh, you can be full time salaried. Like, well, nice. cool. We want to get the heck out of New Jersey anyway, so let's go check out Pittsburgh and see what's around. <laughs> nice, man. Congrats. Well, that's a, that sounds yeah. like a cool gig, man. Yes, yeah, so I'm doing, you know, it's 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 because the web, we have a new website that's almost finished. We've got another sister website for something else that's completely built from the ground up. So it was a lot of copywriting, a lot of product testing, a lot of photography, video production, you know, rebranding, new logos, all that kind of fun stuff. So I'm learning a lot of skills. I'm learning like product photography to like the nerdy level, which is interesting. Like how do you photograph a chrome tube lug? That should be doctoral well, what's the, level. What's the what's the trick on the product uh, the, photography? The trick is reflections because a chrome object is a perfect mirror. So the object doesn't matter. It's what's reflecting into the object is the only thing that So matters. you're off to the side or something? Like you can't you be gotta, in front You got to play with angles. You've got to play with lighting and diffusers. And it, it took me six months to get a decent shot of a brass tube lug. Like just decent. Because it's just so much physics behind it. So that's fun. That's kind of like being a, a drum nerd all over again. Like really, really digging into the nuances of lighting and aperture and all that kind of stuff oh my god mike it's 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 <laughs> that does not sound like fun to me man god bless <laughs> it you. is fun in a certain, well, when you it's like when you when you get the shot though it's like getting the take yeah you're like it's that's like you're it. on this the, the, you're in the serengeti and, and you got the photo of the lion <laughs> without getting yeah. eaten <laughs> you're like that's it it's like the thrill like that drum shell looks perfect like that's a that's a certain thrill to me you know, and then it's also like, then you go back and look at it a week later, you're like, damn, that's really not that good. You know, it's just like drumming. You're like, oh, I sound great. And you listen back, it's like, they're still not even close. You know, like, I don't know what, what that is psychologically, but it's like you, you can you can only see so far. And then when you get there, you can all of a sudden see further, you know, like, that's good. And the next day, no, it's not good to see all that color is not right. Like, it's just a spiraling thing, just like trying to play quarter notes for me. That's in time. No, it's not. You know, I like go right. back and practice a little bit more. Uh, it's yeah. fun. I'm just a nerd for for learning new stuff. I guess that's good. It's that lifelong learning is the is the key, man. And if we just we don't want the moss to grow under our feet, you know, trying to move this whole thing forward. You know, I took about. I don't know if you ever do this to yourself, uh, but like over the holidays, maybe maybe I took like. 20 days off from the sticks in my hands. You know, I mean, I'm embarrassed mm-hmm. to say, but I was just like, oh, take a break. You know, I'll, I'll get my runs and, you know, I'll listen to music and I'll, I'll, I'll spend my time doing some other things. And then you're like, oh, I should never do that again because there's just this, that layer of rust that's after 20 days. And so it takes that first practice session to go like, oh, okay, I'm back. And then now, just even if you just pick up the sticks 20 minutes a day, it's the everyday thing. It's the same as exercise, like every day, just to pick up the sticks. I love it. So now I'm back on track. And I'm like, mm. every day, whether I'm working or not, the sticks are in my hand. It feels so good. Now, when you took those 20 days off, 
did you come back with any fresh perspective or was it like whoa i gotta i gotta scrape it <laughs> i gotta scrape off the edges here like um I've, i'm afraid to do it i haven't done it in i took six months off between grad school and when i first got the modern drummer gig it was like six yeah. months of no gigging and just sort of playing a little bit Oof, because it I was, don't know. It was like finally time. but it was finally like I don't, I don't have to rehearse or practice at night anymore i don't have right. to play gigs i'm gonna sit on the couch and i'm gonna do what normal people do and watch some movies or something you know yes. yeah, man. <laughs> but when i came back it was it was it was not good it was not good right it took yeah, a I'm long time I mean, I don't even really know if I should put that out there in the world, but I mean, there is times that, that that you're just at the end of the year, you're usually around like December 18, you're done. And then if you're not playing Christmas parties or a New Year's Eve gig, you know, then it's usually like the second week of January, things start to pick up, you know. Um, but like I'm going to Cancun next week to play a, a, a big festival. And so now the sticks are back in my hands and I'm watching, listening to live recordings and immersing myself. You know, so much of what you do in music is, is mental but there is that thing of the mind body connection the physicality of having the sticks in your hands it comes back really fast mm. you know mm. i mean your plan is such a high intensity i'd be afraid of of losing like calluses even even if they're not literal calluses of like oh. Oh yeah, blowing my elbow out. You know, <laughs> if I take three weeks off and I come back and all of a sudden my elbow snaps. Your tennis so, elbow. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd be now, afraid of that. Well, the biggest thing with the hands for me is these last few digits where you're like, when you're doing all the rim shots. So these these small guys right here, those will all crack up, especially when it's cold. You know, mm -hmm. and when you're or like when you're playing like uh, right out there outside of the Today Show. You know, and it's like, like zero degrees and you and you're out there mm. whoa and you got to play hard you're getting some cuts man so i'm always travel with that new skin you know it's like part of my gear new skin mm. like awesome band-aids this really took a detour it really did um <laughs> hey so i'm gonna this is something like you know usually when i have jim jim mccarthy here jim mccarthy voiceovers.com he'll ask the guests the random question of the day but i'll do the fave five fave mm. color Favorite color, yeah. um, this kind of blue here, Neptune Ooh. blue or whatever it is. So it's not baby blue. It's like a couple of degrees above it. It's like a, like a, yeah, they call it Neptune. So the color of Neptune. That, and you're that painting blue. your studio that color. A version of that. Yep. Nice. Yep. That's my favorite color. Favorite food, Mike. Or a favorite dish. It could be like a style, like Indian or Italian. No, I don't. I don't want to go there. I would say tacos of all types. Yes, tacos. I. I made it was Taco <laughs> Wednesday last night. I bought the kit. I made. I got the ground chicken. So proud of myself. Got the ground chicken. Added all the seasoning. Last you, you melt a little cheese in there, and then you got the these uh, Ortega street taco shells. You know. And oh was, yeah. And I got some cervezas, and I was just. It was like a taco party by myself. <laughs> yeah, I think I could eat tacos every day. Literally every day. <laughs> Every, and, and breakfast tacos with the eggs that's a good one um i think i know the answer to this because you you and i have libated a couple of times um favorite drink alcohol is tequila for sure yeah 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 man <laughs> yeah i remember when we, we hung out and you were like one more and i was like yeah one more for me too um because i like i was drinking beer that night but you know i you know american you know low calorie beer is so uninteresting i'm more of like like an ipa not too dark on the ipa mm. but it's just there's a complexity to it it tastes like um i don't know it just tastes like higher education in your mouth you know <laughs> now if we're talking beer i like a good german lager like to me you cannot beat a hofbrau or a spaten or something nice okay yeah i kind of went through i have a pretty long history with booze so I kind of went through all the beer phases, you know, of, of super dark and super bitter and stouts and all the flavored things. And then I've just settled back to just give me a good, crisp German lager and I'm good. We're all nice. set. <laughs> I, hey, I got a funny story. One time my, my van can attest to this, but we went to some highfalutin bar in New York City and we had bus call and we had three hours to get the bus call and the guys in the crew dared me to try the monk beer the beer that the monks make in the himalayas or whatever and it's like super 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 oh potent. yeah so like one beer is like worth five beers and i tried one of those yeah suckers. the belgian 
Oh, buddy, I did not show yeah, up to bus. Not home. great, like, right? <laughs> they had to come knocking on my hotel room door, and I was face planted, face down in the bed, man. Thank God they didn't what leave. That's without a Belgian me. veer. What is that called? There's. Remember the show? Did you ever see the show Three Sheets? No. With Zane Lamprey. No. I think he did like six seasons. He'd travel around the world. He would visit like the whatever the local alcohol thing is. He would go to a brewery or go to a distillery or he went to a monastery or whatever. And then that night he would party with the locals, yeah. get housed. And then the next morning he would have whatever the local hangover helper was for that. It's city. called Six Sheets? Three Sheets. Three Sheets. Six it's is better. so I mean, good. Yeah. Six sheets. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. So it's got to be on. It's got to be on Hulu, Amazon Prime, or one of. Yeah, it's got to be. He has. A, he has a couple other shows after that, like Drinking Made Easy or something. But Three Sheets was special because it was like comedy, travel, food. You were learning about all the boozes. That's where I learned about the Belgian ales that you're mm. talking about. It was really, for me, it was like the perfect kind of travel. I think it was like the one of the first HD TV shows. Remember the uh, HD channel that was yeah. just like yeah like whale videos and whatever yeah and he had a show on there three sheets highly recommend it i bought I all like the dvds a, when that was still a thing i like a good sperm whale man um favorite band this is hard man if does it have to be a band um yeah favorite band the john coltrane quartet damn man yes wow elvin Love jones Supreme jimmy garrison yep yeah. mccoy tyner that band is the the greatest band of all time I that'll think. make your hand your hair stand up for sure man it's like in love supreme will take you to a another place yeah i don't think we would have led zeppelin if it wasn't for john coltrane like there's so many things we wouldn't have had mitch mitchell and jimmy hendrix if it wasn't for the john coltrane quartet so yeah they're my favorite 100 i agree man mitch mitchell loved his triplets i mean he loved that he yeah. had that you yeah. could hear it you could hear it yeah, yeah. it's like a loud now, Evan jones i i hate to even do this i mean you could try or you could list five. It's hard to do a favorite drummer, right? I mean, for me, I would just have to say like, I would just say Stuart Copeland because he was the one that, that I said, I'm gonna do this from with my life because this guy is turning me on so much, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's been a million ones since, but, or you could say like, what was the one that made you want to be a drummer? Because we're about the same age, I think a little. Uh, oh yeah, I'll I'll um I'll give you I'll answer both of those. The the oh, no I, I can even do that. The drummer that made me want to be a drummer. Um, that wasn't like a local drummer that that I was, I was just, it would be Alex Van Halen yeah. slash Will Will Calhoun. Those two, Alex Van Dude. Halen, and then Will Calhoun. Is, how about that Vivid record? I mean, that's that was the first one, right? Cult of Personality. Yeah. That, that drum sound was life. like right here, like smashed against yep. your face. Changed my life. I, I remember it was Easter, and every Easter my my parents would take me to Kmart, I believe, to get a get a tape. <laughs> you know, like and that year it was Cheap Trick, Don't Be Cruel, yep, and Living Color Vivid. I had them both in my hand. It's like, do I want Cheap Trick or do I want Living Color Vivid? I went with Living Color Vivid, and it just, again, the universe said, you definitely want to go that way because that's going to change your life. And I played to that record every day for two years. My friends would come over, and we would skateboard and listen to that record. Awesome. We played video games, and we listened to that record. So Will Calhoun, number one, first influence. Favorite drummer, uh, it's got to be Elvin Jones. There you go. I, I, I can listen to anything he's ever played on his entire career, and it's, I'm still learning. I'm still discovering. One, one of a kind, one of a kind. I've, I've got some cool um, Elvin um, transcriptions I did at UNT. Um, and nice. there's so there's some things that you can't transcribe. They, they are yeah. untranscribable, but they're beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, he puts like, he adds too many notes into his phrasing sometimes. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but, but it's he, cool. There's, but there's the one, boom. <laughs> um, did you get to hang with uh, Will Calhoun over the years or tell him uh, thank you for the influence or yeah? Yeah yeah so he i went to see my buddy david haynes play with stanley jordan at the iridium in new york city yeah i don't know 12 years ago or whatever and i didn't i didn't know that will had played with with stanley jordan for a while too so he was there he was at the bar just hanging out and i just sat behind him and sat beside him and just we just hung out like like just peers just just fellow drummers just chatting it was crazy and then he played md fest 
I don't know, several years later, and I was kind of assigned to just help him get his kit together. So I was just hanging with him, tuned his second bass drum. He was like, nope, make it up even higher. I had that thing crank so high. Wow. So that was when I kind of told him, like, you know, you're the reason I play this silly instrument. <laughs> like, you're literally the reason why I'm here at this moment. It was That's cool. awesome. That's so nice when yeah, you get to I share that. Yeah. And I mean, all the loop stuff I do is coming from him, too. Like, I yeah. saw him do a wave drum a clinic where he would come out front and improvise on the wave drum and then set up a loop and go jam over top of it and it was top five solo drum performances i've ever seen it was just so like soul stirringly badass so even awesome. everything i've been doing since still is ripped off from will <laughs> soul stirring i love that man ah i love what we do man why well, man what a fun conversation i feel like we could talk forever everybody check out Mike Dawson drums.com and on your socials, a lot of it is at Mike Dawson drums, I believe. Mm -hmm. And people can reach out to you to take online lessons. You could uh, book Mike for clinics. And then of course you're doing programming and drum tracks from your home studio for singer, songwriters, artists, composers around the world. Um, I remember you reached out to me one time to pick my brain and you sent me a track. I was like, this is great. I do just keep this up. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what I can tell you. It sounds great. Just do it as much as humanly possible. And so since that happened, I'm sure I'm sure you're on fire, man, doing that all the time. Well, one of the greatest honors of my career was to be replaced by you on a track. So thank you. Oh, God. <laughs> Jeez, man. And and I probably played your part. And I, it's like, why is this happening? But I, you know, sure, okay. No, I love it. I love that stuff. Near, I, you know, I got near on some stuff. I mean, it's like sometimes, like, get, get the guy that you, if you want me to sound like that guy, get get that guy. That's funny. I Here's just did number. Near, Call man. him up. Was, on Sunday, we yeah. had an episode with Near. Yeah, man. Such a small, crazy world, man. I love it. We're so lucky to be part of this community. And, man, you are changing the world. I'm happy to uh, call you a friend, man. And thanks for your time today. Congratulations on the new gig and the podcast, the Drum Candy Podcast, wherever you find podcasts, is amazing. Listen to one episode. You guys will be hooked. Fantastic, man. Thank you so much, Rich. Always a pleasure. Yeah, buddy. We'll have to have, drink some tequila. So stay safe out there, man. I appreciate your time greatly. And to all the listeners out there, hey, guys, we appreciate you. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the podcast, helps people celebrate the podcast. And it really does help, man. Leave us a review. We really appreciate it. We'll keep coming back for the good stuff. We're going to be here. All right. So we'll see you guys next time. Mike, thanks, man. Thank you. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.